Hey guys. Well, I couldn't think of any better way to start this video than showing a clip of Art Scholl flying uh, his third Super Chipmunk. Um, he did have three of them. Uh, the first one was a slightly modified uh, de Havilland DHC-1 Chipmunk. Had the same engine, but a slightly clipped wing and, of course, the iconic uh, rudder shape. His second chipmunk, which is the one that this one's being modeled after, which is uh, tail number N1114V, he did not build this airplane. This is probably the one he's most well known for, um, but this was not built by him. This was modified by Skip Volk, and when he was killed in the early 70s, um, Art bought the air. Art was able to get the airplane. Uh, the one in the video was the third. Was actually the. It was his third. Hold on a minute. Now I'm confusing myself. This was his third chipmunk right here, N1114 V. Uh, the one in the video was the one that he pretty much built from the ground up. He took parts from a stock to Havilland chipmunk, and completely disassembled everything and modified it to uh, that version that you saw in the video. They had the retractable landing gear and the geared engine. So, love that video. I got tons, tons of Art Scholl videos. He's, he's my hero. Unfortunately, uh, he was killed uh, before I was even born. So, oh well, things happen. His, uh, his memory will last forever. Anyway, so this is the Wendell Hostetler 30% Super Chipmunk. And I know I've talked about this plane in the past that I was, I think I originally said I'm thinking about buying the kit. Then I said I bought the kit but don't know when I'm going to start it. Well, I started it. Um, the reason that I've started it right now is I reached a point on the 310 where I ran out of money. Oh, excuse me. Which seems to happen a lot. Uh, the last update video on the 310, I got the right hand nacelle completely finished. Um, you know, hi Cody. It's got all the guts in there, fuel tanks, are, everything's ready to go. Um, but I couldn't do anything with the left nacelle until I got the other engine. But this time of year, December, January, yeah, with the holidays and car insurance comes due, club memberships, AMA membership, you know, yeah. Play money goes bye-bye during this time of the year, so I had kind of a kind of a gap period that I needed something to do, so I decided to get some work done on this while I wait for the new engine, which just arrived. So I figured I'd show this video real quick. Uh, before I put it away and finish up the 310. Um, the construction has been interesting so far. And I mean interesting because not a whole lot fits very well. Not sure why. Um, if you've built a lot of airplanes, especially planes like this, um, that are normally from plans, um, this was cut by National Balsa. The balsa, the quality of the wood is very good. His laser cutting is very good. Um, but I'm just, I'm wondering if, because uh, some of these formers really did not fit very well as far as lining up with one another. Um, they, a lot of them were pretty far off. Uh, the biggest one was right here. The R1 rib for the rudder was actually a half inch too short. So I had to put a, Put a scab on there and make a new opening for the for the support to run through but it's not that big a deal really you know if you're building an airplane like this you need to have some building experience uh, the construction is different than what probably a majority of people are used to um, a, good, uh, a lot of big airplanes are built with the crutch style construction like uh, like the Zeroli airplanes um, my favorite construction is the Carl Goldberg construction, which was the uh, 
lock and slot construction where the whole fuselage is basically put together with rubber bands holding it together then you kind of squish it and move it around to the shape you want because it's being held together with rubber bands you get it where you want it then you start hitting all the joints with thin CA boom fuselage this is quite a bit different um, it doesn't actually have any bulkheads or formers per se what it is is all these individually cut uh, braces that go across uh, some of them in the more structure you know in the more structural structurally important areas let me put it that way have these gussets underneath of them even though I'm pretty sure this one this one and this one are going to be removed once the fuselage is finished so I have access to my radio compartment um, but the way it works out on this one is from this point right here you can see there's a three a three ply doubler right here you have plywood balsa and plywood all sandwiched so from this point here to the firewall all of these are exactly the same length so I was able to cut you know one two three four five six you know whatever I was able to cut them all to the right size and then uh, lay my fuselage sides down on the plans and get the locations where they need to be put on the fuselage since they're not marked uh, so either yeah you can see you know pencil marks right here that distinguish where they go so once it was all put together and glued in I went ahead and I'm a, I'm a cheap bastard I can't help it uh, I could just go to the hardware store and buy a little aluminum square. I like to just make my own out of just scrap balsa. This is what, quarter inch by half inch or whatever. And I don't use them very long. I use them for the duration of a project and throw them away because it's wood. It's going to change shape over time. But once it was all put together as far as the front portion to make sure it was square this way, because you don't want the fuselage sides to be crooked. I make a little deal like this, then I can go in there, check it for squareness, and it was off a little bit, so I was able to kind of tweak it to tweak it a little bit, and then put these cross pieces in here, one here, one here, and one down there, and that holds it in that square position, because from this point back, the fuselage starts to taper. So each of these braces here are all different sizes. So each one had to be cut individually by taking measurements from the plans. Kind of a pain in the butt, but it is what it is. And after each one I put in, I would go back to the back part of the fuselage, grab the two uh, ass end pieces, and pinch them together. And as long as I pinch them together, and they lined up perfect with each other and I know I'm keeping the fuselage square it's not it's not you know getting all cattywampus on me um, and by doing that method it pretty much it's a it's a foolproof method if your two fuselage sides are exactly the same size you're square up front you pinch them together in the back and they're straight there's no way you could get a banana shape because the only way you can build a fuselage into a banana is if you have one side that's longer than the other or if it's crooked from the get-go so I already knew this was square and the rest falls into place now most of the time and if you read build threads I mean first let's just look at this I mean I know it's just on camera but that's a really straight frickin fuselage okay I mean it's it's straight normally you would get a laser level and put it right here and you would follow it straight down and you would build the fuselage and make adjustments as you go to make sure that that fuselage is straight I don't do that I do everything by eye I've been told I'm insane for doing that for many years but if I can't rely on my eyes then I shouldn't even be in this hobby so and it's never let me down in the past I mean, even looking at my Panther, this was a very easy airplane to build crooked because of the, the height of the tail fin that's built into the fuselage. But it's all done by eye, and it's perfect. So, 
my eyes haven't let me down yet. My, my eyesight's getting worse by the day, but I can still build a straight airplane. So, um, I've kind of gotten to a point where I pretty much have to stop here pretty soon. Sorry for the camera jiggling. I repositioned here. Um, I got to a point where I can't put the stringers on yet until I finish the tail section because the stringers um, are going to, they work their way around the fin area. So I need the fin finished and I can't finish off the fin until I build the stab because everything interlocks. So there's, there's a lot of work that has to be done back here before I can start attaching stringers. This one I just put on there because, I don't know, I just wanted to put it on there. It's not glued or anything, it's just sitting in there. Um, but I'm probably going to put a stringer right here. Probably run one down the front on the top here and a couple on the side. Just because these formers are pretty wobbly and I don't want them to get broken. So if I have at least one stringer in there, then they'll be nice and strong. Um, I still have to build a tray in here for my fuel tank. And none of this is in the plans. So this is a very, uh, I like to call it a fill-in-the-blank kind of construction. Which I kind of prefer. Because for those of you out there watching that are builders, I'm sure you have built an airplane where you did not like the construction. You didn't like the way something was done. But there's not a whole lot you can do about it because it's already done for you in the kit. So if you're going to change it, you're changing the way the kit goes together. So parts won't fit. Well, with this type of construction, the plans are basically giving you a shell of an airplane. And you figure the rest out yourself. Which is fine with me. Because I like to do that kind of stuff on my own anyway. Like it doesn't give any particulars on where to put servos um, and I like that I'm gonna put them wherever I want anyway so I'd rather not have a spot already built into the plane to hold servos because I'm gonna put them where I want to so now I haven't decided all that stuff yet I can't sheet the fin or the rudder or anything yet until I get my my hard points for my hinges the hard point for the the music wire that's going to go down for uh, the tail wheel. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. But I just wanted to get something done on it um, to kind of help me get motivated to continue on it in the future. So I'm going to put this away for now, get the 310 back out, uh, get the other nacelle finished, get the rest of the markings put on. Then I'll do another video showing the finished product of that. But for now, just to show everybody that the project has begun, pretty excited. This is my favorite airplane. You know, I got, you know, I got one up there. I got a free flight one. That's actually a Gillows kit for a de Havilland chipmunk that I modified into a super chipmunk. I built that thing when I was eight years old, and it actually flew once, believe it or not. And I still have the Goldberg chipmunk in here. So, chipmunks everywhere. Can't have enough of them. I could easily get rid of every single plane I have and just have a squadron of chipmunks and I'd be I'd be a happy camper. Not going to do that, but you never know. So, stay tuned. Um, as soon as the 310 is done, I'll start doing more update videos on the chipmunk. It's not going to get finished this winter, that's that's for sure. I have no plans on flying it this year. Um, there's a lot of big ticket items that are going to be going into this project. I mean, the landing gear itself is like 450 bucks, And they're not even retracts. Ugh. So, plus canopy, cowl, wheel pants. It adds up. It's, it's, it's going to be an expensive airplane. And I haven't decided if I'm going to eliminate one of my larger airplanes that has a DLE-111. I got two planes right now that have DLE-111s in it. And that's what I want to power this with. So I'm trying to figure out, do I want to part ways with one of those airframes 
and just take all the guts and throw it in here? Or do I want to buy everything for this plane? I can't decide. The two bigger planes that I have that I'm debating on parting out are a Cardin 35% extra and my Big Cub, which I know all of you have seen if you've watched my videos, you've seen the Big Cub. But I just can't bring myself to part with either of those airplanes. But you never know. Who knows what the future holds. Every year I fly a lot, a lot less. So having all these airplanes is becoming kind of silly. Um, I really don't want to get rid of anything, but I hate having all this stuff just sitting around and doing nothing. I don't know. Hopefully one of these days I'll get my motivation back and really be, and really start flying a lot more again. Just these past few years has been really weird. I've had no ambition, no ambition to fly. I still love going to the events. I have, I have way too many good friends in this hobby to to ever allow me to completely get away from the hobby. I couldn't do it because I'd be losing too many friends. But this year, just like last year, I'm going to all the events I normally go to. But I may not be flying this year. I don't know yet. I don't know. We'll see. Well, stay tuned. Probably here in another week or so, I'll have the uh, the other nacelle done for the 310. And I'll be able to uh, get a video down here of this entire menagerie put together out on the floor. So that'll be kind of cool. So stay tuned for that video. But until then, see you guys later.